Hello and welcome, my gentle and of course very modern apes. I'm being extra kind and agreeable today because I need to ask your forgiveness. I once again relapsed and went and argued on the Standing for Truth channel with a bunch of young earth creationists about a bunch of different things. But the good news for you, and kind of the good news for me, is that you guys seem to like these videos. So it ends up working out in my favor most of the time. I just know that, again, it's like, as I said before, it's like eating junk food. I know I shouldn't be doing this. It's not good for me. Still, every now and again, I like to get a little rowdy and hop into a room and get into an argument with young earth creationists, specifically about hominins, because of course that's my specialty. And since these days I don't get many offers for debating young earth creationism anymore, why that is, I don't know. I like to take what I can get, and sometimes I just get a little bloodlust in my heart. You know, I want to go out there and, and fight. The conversation you're about to hear is unedited. I debated as to whether or not I wanted to hop in with commentary here and there, but I figured that I wanted to present it in like the most honest way possible, uh, and that's how it is. There is one thing I will tell you ahead of time. Towards the end, in a conversation about Homo floresiensis, I do, regrettably, make a mistake. Cringe. I'm sorry to shatter the image that you all have of me that is no doubt that of a perfect simian goddess who never makes any mistakes ever. But, alas, it has happened. Basically, there's a part at the end where we're talking about Homo floresiensis, and in my head, I was like, the reason that we think of Homo floresiensis as having connections to Australopithecus is because of the trapezium and the trapezoids, some, some bones of the carpals, um, bones in the wrist, the carpals, but actually it does also have a flared ilium. And this is something that I was kind of like, oh, wait, it does? So, you know, forgot about that. It was my bad, it was my mistake. And that was the only thing I ever got wrong, ever, including the future. Anyways, you guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you enjoyed the conversation. It was very fun for what it's worth. There's quite a bit of rowdiness in the middle. Things get a little intense, uh, really only when I'm talking to Sam or Redefine Living. Uh, but other than that, things seem to go pretty well, I think. Uh, let me know what you think of it in the comments, and I'll be back here at the end of this to, to give my closing thoughts. Hello, hello. It's hello. good to be on. How is everybody? Well, I hope. That could be an AI voice, though. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't know. I've seen some days. pretty Troll, yeah. AIs yeah. these days. I'm I'm known to be uh to be famous enough that that my haters go to great lengths to impersonate me everywhere I go. Here, hold on. <laughs> I'll funny. I'll uh I'll show myself, but I'm probably not gonna do that a lot because I'm in my PJs. No, we know <laughs> <laughs> we know it's you. We know it's you, no worries. I'll put I'll put the camera back on if I need to use any of my props, but until then. <laughs> You get yourself comfortable. So good to have uh, Guts at Gibbon, the uh, celebrity here on the evolution side and basically the creation <laughs> side too. So welcome to the uh, late night panel discussion. Currently we're on the nature of mutations, beneficial genetic entropy, you know, tossing a little of that in there. So feel free to join in and I'm sure we'll slowly shift to hominins. Erica. Yeah, sure. I mean, I'm I'm working on a fairly large video right now on um on the transitional nature of all of the hominins. It's going to be quite large, but I realized I I need to get a good perspective on um on I need to get my finger on the pulse, as it were, on where creationists are at on on where that line is drawn. So that's what I'm here to try and inquire about today. But yeah, I can throw I can throw my hat in the ring on some of this stuff. I mean, the the realm that I'm most comfortable in is is macroscopic, but you know I can give my opinion as long as I'm not going to be uh, a, accused of impersonating a geneticist. I promise, Doctor Dan's not on the line. <laughs> um, I did watch your panel discussion with reasons to believe. Yeah, and man, I thought that was master. good. And credit where credit is due, I was. I think you did a fantastic job defending the sophisticated nature of, of Neanderthals, demonstrating their intelligence. I understand you would hold to a differing position than me and Sam, right? You'd say they're a different species. But nonetheless, I think you did a good job providing the evidence that is contrary to the RTB model. Yeah, so I, I, I enjoyed that. I've asked Fuzz about that quite a few times. A, a long while back, I had a, a you know discussion with him on modern day debate, and I, to my understanding, he doesn't quite have a model yet that that he's using to kind of bolster that idea. Um, so I, I don't know where that's going to go. I, I think that the line as it is right now is is a little bit arbitrary, and that's what I told him. You know, I mean, 
Neanderthals were incredibly capable hominins. If you want to look at it from the perspective of conventional science, they really outdid homo sapiens when it comes to tenure on the planet. If that's how you want to measure success, they did quite well for themselves. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm interested, you know, they've, there's speaking, I mentioned in the side chat here, um, with regard to genetic entropy, I am really curious to talk to Paul Price about it because there have been some very complete ancient genomes that have been published as of late. Uh, and as somebody who isn't a geneticist, I have looked at them. Um, they span tens of thousands of years, uh, which in the younger time scale would is still spanning a time frame, right? It's it shrunk down, but it is still spanning a time frame. There is no degradation there. Um, Wrangell Island mammoths, maybe, but that's because they're they're experiencing island dwarfism. But outside of the Wrangell Island mammoths, you're gonna be you're gonna get some interesting stuff out of these these ancient genomes. So I'd love to talk to Paul about that. How did they uh, if determine I may, really the, quick, uh, the date? Erica, of I, the, that I recently you're saw your video. Ten thousand uh, years old. <laughs> There's um, a lot of both talking at once, like um, <laughs> yeah. Doc or Sam. Go ahead, okay, why don't um, we start it, with? Doc, because he has been quiet for a while. And then Sam, we'll throw it right back to you, brother. Thank you. Just uh, on that topic, Erica, uh, I saw your video on Paranthropus recently, and I I, I kind of went on a little uh, excited paleontologist rampage, sharing that everywhere I could. Great, <laughs> great stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I'm, I'm curious as to how the creation, how you guys are, are taking that news. I mean, we've got proteins from Paranthropus, and they nest firmly in the hominins um like it's it's pretty it's pretty interesting stuff and the more of this stuff that's going to come out the harder and harder it's going to be to draw that line after all genetics is what matters right donnie that's going to be the a, a hard sell but um no no it, it's all about the fossil record yeah Fossils well that's, are inherited I sure permanent, so. that's not genes traits i'm just kidding that's that's yeah, no, my but... bread and butter man and you know now that i've actually <laughs> had some experience in the field i i know I actually know how it's done, which, you know, I didn't, I, I knew how it was done through other people, but personal experience is a different animal entirely. So I, I'm pleased to have that feather in my cap. Well, so first of all, water did you take a day? How much water did I take a day? Yeah. Oh my God. I mean, we probably brought out, I brought, I brought out a person, personally a two liter and I filled it up at least uh -huh. once. While I was out, I mean, it's, flask. It's, it's hot. Yeah. I actually had a hydro flask. My sister got me one, but it got really bent. I dropped it a couple times in the airport. They do work very well. Yeah, they're they're <laughs> you know, the, yeah. the, the field side doesn't have any cool water anyways. The water's already warm, so there's nothing to keep hot. Mm -hmm. or well, here's cold. here's the secret. <laughs> here's the secret. Lots of coconut water, like Mark. I'm getting over a week long cold, about eighty percent better, nice. and lots of coconut water and normal water for me. So, but with that being said. Paul Price, he will be here, if I'm not mistaken, September 7th. We're doing a genetic entropy open mic. So, Erica, if you oh, can wow. join that, that'd be awesome. Yeah, so, no, you know Paul and I go way back, actually. I've known Paul longer than I've known right. anybody in this panel. There, you, It'll be a reunion of old pals. Yeah, be, and, be careful advertising that. You're going to attract everybody from the debate evolution. Oh, I know. And you're going to get Joel. <laughs> you're going to get the whole gang will be here for that. Zach's actually interested in speaking with Paul as well, I heard. So we'll see. That'll be a night to remember. And Sam, to be fair, you're going to say something when yeah. Doc was going to say something. So let's let's now throw it to you. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. So Erica, um, glad you're here. So you you said that they found some ancient DNA and that it's how old was it? Well, it depends on the specimen. Well, the ones that you were, uh, were referring to. You said pro pro Probosidium? The proboscidean DNA? Uh, the one that you just referenced. Uh, Paranthropus? I'm not sure. Whichever one uh, you referenced. The hominin? Whichever one you referenced. I think, I think you said, that they, you said that they found some DNA right. and it was, I think you said tens of thousands of years old and it was in amazingly great shape. Oh, no. Yeah. Well, yeah. So so for proboscideans, those are um, mammoths and and their relatives, mammoths, mastodons, mastodons and things like that. Um, How, they, they're all... They're all within a couple hundred thousand years of one another, I believe. Um, but I believe there are several of them that get as close as like tens of thousands or even some found within the same section of permafrost. How did they come up with those dates? I believe with permafrost, they tend to use ash layers above and below. So they were carbon, they were using certain dating methods of the soil instead of like a, a like a molecular clock. 
a genetic you, type talk. You you mean are, you mean they're using like geologic methods, yeah. like geochronology? Yeah. So I oh, I yeah. found I because I have an article about some woolly mammoths that they found, and when they tested the DNA, um, they and this is a secular. I'll try to find the source. They're saying they were surprised because it died in an ice age, which they alleged was you know quite some time ago. But they're saying that the DNA that they examined, they determined that it was only just a few thousand years old. Well, they, mammoths lived and, a few thousand years ago. They the, the last of the mammoths went extinct on Wrangell Island when the Great Pyramids were being built. So I, that's not surprising to me at all. The confusion is they had conflicting dating methods because on one hand, this, the, the soil or the layers that they found this in, the ice layers, were, were supposed to be much older than the genetic analysis itself. And so uh, that's why I was asking you when you say that you found this DNA and it's hundreds of thousands of years old is that or however old it was. Was that because of a genetic analysis or because that you were, you know, dating the soils around it? Well, I believe you can do typically, especially as of late, you do it with both. So you corroborate the molecular clock with the fossil record. That's actually one of the coolest things about hominins is that we see the divergences via the molecular clock matching up pristinely with what but we just, find, the dates that we find in the fossil record. So I'm yeah, assuming so what, they did both, but I don't study proboscidians, so I couldn't tell you. I don't know which ones they used. I know they used geochronology, but I'm not sure if they did a molecular clock on it or not. I mean, I certainly think it would be interesting, but what I what I found notable on it was that it was like two dozen mammoth genomes, right? We're not talking one or two. We're talking about two dozen mammoth genomes, right? Like this isn't a little bit of DNA. This is gobs and gobs and gobs of DNA. Were you yeah, saying that's earlier not, that yeah, the, that's not what I'm calling into question? Yeah, I was saying earlier that the mammoth genome. Go oh, ahead. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, you go ahead. Oh no, I was just questioning how you derive that date. I mean, you say, well, we found some DNA and then we dated the Earth and we think this is how old it is. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Radiometric dating works beautifully. I mean, I can argue radiometric dating with you if you want. I'm happy to do that. I will do that all day long. But that's not what I came here to do. I'll do it if you want. If you guys want to turn this into a conversation about radiometric dating, I've got sources out the wazoo. In well, fact, a requirement though, Erica, to discuss radiometric dating, you have to know what the heat problem is. You ever heard of that? Oh, oh no, <laughs> enlighten me. No idea. Yeah, we, we can teach you about it. So <laughs> didn't you and McLean I never heard of a the solution, heat Donnie? Didn't you say you were going to release the equation on it? Donnie, the equation for this solution was uh, going to Don't come? worry, McQueen, McQueen is working on it, Mark. He's been working on it. We'll, we'll see. Found it on a stream of Donnie's, and um, he was going to present it, and then we didn't hear anything. Uh, are you ready for that, Donnie? We can, maybe you can present it tonight. It's a, it's a secret for now, but one of these days right. we'll reveal the big equation. I'm it's like, if you ever see the ending of Interstellar, where you've got about 16 different blackboards, it, it's a big equation. So, one I, of these days, we'll I bet it. it is a big equation. I bet that equation is absolutely huge. I think you should probably tell you know the other. Young Earth creationists, geologists, and physicists who've been working on this for you know decades. First, though, <laughs> don't tell us first. Tell them first. So I'll, I'll talk. Sorry, I'll, I'll talk to McQueen about here. it. But I don't want us to go too far off track. So I was asking earlier. Well, firstly, we were just kind of finishing the the final point on the Lensky experiment and the fact that what they observed overall, in light of a few interesting adaptive episodes, were. Uh, reductive evolution, shrinking functional genome sizes. And Erica, you probably remember you co-modded that debate with me years ago, Dr. Kevin Anderson and Jackson Rowe. And Dr. Kevin Anderson advanced a paper from, I believe, 2021. And it demonstrated that a lot of these beneficial mutations in the Lensky bacteria, they've uh, been lost and they did not drift to fixation. Well, and in so which the, environment? In, in, well, in, in that medium that they're growing the one in. When they evolved in or the initial medium? I believe the ones that the beneficial mutations evolved in, quote unquote. Where they were the citrate plus. I, I, I'm not sure I believe that. I'd need to see that because I, I thought I had heard that they'd done that when reintroduced to the initial medium. And it's basically just a bigger version of the antibiotics fitness thing. But that's just. I mean, guys, that's just changing the definition of fitness, right? Like fitness is context specific. There, there's do, you not find it, fitness. do you find it curious, though, that after all these generations of E. coli bacteria, 
overall, they've just lost a lot of genes. They've shrunk in functional genome size. Do you find that to be curious or is that expected? Well, my understanding, my understanding is that their genome shrunk and also were measurably more efficient. That's the same thing that happened that's happened to the human homo sapiens brain over the past 300,000 years. I mean, our brain case size used to be bigger. It used to be close to what the Neanderthal upper end, not upper end, no, the, up close to the Neanderthal average, like with the Jebel Erhud stuff, right? Like it used to be quite a bit larger, but it's gotten smaller, right? When you look at the endocasts of those things, the organization is not different. When you take our genomes back in time, you look at ancient DNA from humans, we're not getting stupider. We're not dumber than the people that lived at the, in the past. What's actually going on is the brains are getting more efficient. And you can actually pin this down to specific genes for, for, um, for creating like, I believe it's like radial glial cells and things like that. So but, no, I, that's not surprising to me at all. I, as long as they're actually getting more efficient, which that was my understanding of it, but it's been, gosh, a year since I've looked at the Lensky stuff. How do you know it's that's my correct? Under, it's my understanding. Sam, I also know that you were going to say something. Matt probably wants to get in on it. So pretty soon we'll probably organize the panel a little as we move into human evolution too. Um, it's my understanding that in order to get these bacterial species to essentially replicate faster. We were talking about this earlier. A lot of DNA was was knocked out, pre-existing systems eliminated. Um, to your point on the hominins, whether it's Arachdis, uh, Naledi, Hobbit, the smaller brain size could be due to, and I know you have talked about this, uh, reductive adaptation, as in these isolated populations, we know that brains are energetically costly. And so selection would actually favor a reduced brain size in order that the species doesn't require as much external resources. Well, yes, it could, but that's, we see both trends all across hominin evolution. Like there's not just a single line of hominins with bigger, bigger, bigger brains. You see brain case size go up and down within australopiths. You see it go up and down in genus homo. Um, and there are there are a great many extremely successful hominins that had brain case sizes all over the place. Case in point, Homo erectus sensuleto. I mean, if you look at those guys, if, if you're looking at it from a conventional perspective and you're looking at it in a broad sense, they lived for two million years and their brain case sizes all over the place, dependent on the environments they live in. So, you know, sometimes brains are big, sometimes brains are small, sometimes they're more efficient, sometimes they're less efficient. Some of this is luck of the draw. Some of this is, is active selection. It's entirely dependent on which hominin population we're looking at and where they're at, as well as um, as well as uh, taking into account the intraspecific variation. So, for instance, in Dimenesi, are we looking at are we looking at a single species there? I mean, this is these are questions that you have to ask. You well, know, in, 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 you, the, in the Dimenesi fossil group, you have morphology consistent with correct me if I'm wrong, Neanderthals, Heidelbergensis and erectus and some homo sapiens that's a lot well, of variation well you don't have any you don't have any defining characteristics of homo sapiens like any okay. of homo sapiens or right. neanderthals you've, right, you've derived that. characteristics because homo sapiens also has them but like by and large the dimenisi specimens i mean you know me right like i think splitting species up sometimes makes things easier to understand. I think they should be Homo georgicus. I think that they are tremendously morphologically different uh, from any other type of, of Homo erectus and indeed from Homo ergaster as well. So you'd consider yourself more, size. Oh, you'd consider yourself more of a lumper than a splitter um, overall? It depends. It, it depends. I mean, like, for instance, I, I have to take each hominin in stride and look at its individual morphology to see if I think it's distinct. Right. Like I've been reading a lot about uh, SCW 573, the little foot specimen, a hominin that I am shocked is not in contested bones, by the way. I, I did not realize that on my first read through. But the more I've been, you know, looking back through, it's been a while since I've done an episode. I realized it's not in there. I don't understand why Africanus isn't in there, period. We don't have Australopithecus Africanus, one of the best represented Australopith species in contested bones at all. There's no Mrs. Plez, there's no Sturkfontein specimens, there's nothing. Well, Mrs. Plez is Sturkfontein, but there's there's nothing. I don't understand it, especially because Sediba's in there and we have less of Sediba than we do of Africanus. But like, 
for instance, the the author Clark, um, especially in 2019, he argues that SDW 573 should be is distinct enough from Australopithecus africanus that it should be Australopithecus prometheus. I don't know that I buy that, right? Like I I don't know that Yul Rock buys it, and he's the big uh, Australopithecus uh, facial morphology guy, right? But like. You know, you see what I mean? Like, it depends on the specimen. But at the same time, I think that there's plenty of, of support to argue that the Dimenisi specimens are indeed distinct from Homo erectus. Well, m maybe let's, and it's such a massive topic that I do feel like there's several different points on the table currently. Let's try well, and hold it. Because yeah. I, I got a question for you. And, I, and okay. I'd be pleased to hear this from every creationist in here. I got my notebook out. So I, I want to okay, know. Well, <laughs> what what is the most no, wait, I, Erica before you do though just because I do want to at least address one thing and Matt I understand what it would uh, agree with me here there's a lot of uh, variation in the human uh, kind basically you can say and so I think evidence for that is in what you're talking about where we find these uh, fossils in the same location where you've got morphology and traits consistent with different groups you said you put them all in the homo georgicus uh so i would say with humans there is a lot of variation whether it's erectus whether it's heidelbergensis whether it's uh neanderthalensis but to the brain size you would interpret you know, a smaller brain with australopithecus up to homo habilis up to Homo erectus and eventually Homo sapiens. But we do see a lot of overlap, at least with your, um, your, your Homo group, right? And so, yeah, we see some big uh, brain with big sizes, some with um, smaller brain sizes. But again, a lot of the species with the smaller brain sizes, those are those that exist in isolated inbred populations, including the island populations, right? Like Floresiensis, Luzonensis. Well, it's, it's only those two. Like of your small brain hominins, only those two are seemingly in isolation. And they're not really in isolation, right? Like they don't have any, and we don't have DNA from them yet. I know that um, that Matt Tichiri is is trying to get some some DNA from some of the molars, but I mean, you know, the Lingbua cave isn't exactly ideal. It's pretty open. It's not great for preservation. It's not like pulling proteins from a parenthibus tooth hidden away in a cave in, in the belly of South Africa where it's dark and encapsulated. Um, yeah, they're not inbred. There's nothing to make us think that Homo naledi is inbred or that the that the Chinese variations, the early Chinese variations of Homo erectus are inbred or that the Georgian population is inbred. And I see that you've got this, that you've got this um, this paper appear by Tattersall. It, I don't know why why this is still on the table, guys. Like there is there is a complete field of paleopathology, where you can look well, at- the Actually, Erica, before you go to the paper, the, but would you not agree if these groups existed in small tribes, in small numbers, and they interbred within that small group or small tribe for many generations, what happens in those circumstances, in those situations? They become inbred. And then yes, a lot of those- Inbred related conditions could come to the forefront. They could drift to fixation. And then you have an entire group that has those types of anomalous features, the small well, brain sure. size. But, well, sure. Okay. But when you look at when you look at Neanderthals, right, a lot of their their apomorphies, their defining characteristics, right? They appear relatively early in their evolutionary in their evolutionary history and they stick around. They're not an artifact of inbreeding. And not only that, we have pretty dang old Neanderthal genomes. And not all of them are indicative of an inbred population. And yet they still have these robust Neanderthal characteristics. They have the retromolar gap, the occipital bun, sweat back zygomatics, right? They've got, they've got the whole nine yards, the large nasal aperture. Um, and it depends on where you're looking in the Pleistocene, right? But right. I, I wouldn't argue that those robust features of Neanderthal are due to inbreeding or genetic degeneration, I would argue that those are eco-glacial adaptations. Yeah, so. that's, that's interesting. My old advisor, um, an old advisor of mine was actually a big guy who argued against that. He, he used to say the Neanderthal face is not cold adapted. And I don't know that I believe that. I'm not sure if that, that I buy that. Him and I argued quite a bit over it, but um, 
you know, I guess his best case is that you also have Neanderthals living with those same adaptations in the Iberian Peninsula, right, in Cima de los Huesos, in these areas that are abjectly not freezing cold locations. And that was what his argument was, is that, you know, we see these adaptations everywhere. There's got to be something else for it. But that's neither here nor there, right? I, I don't think you can use paleopathology to explain to explain the variation in, in hominids. And the reason why I say that so confidently is because we clock paleopathology in a great many hominins, as you just showed with that paper. We know what to look for. The only reason we know how to clock paleopathology is, or when we, no, how, the only reason we know when to clock paleopathology is because we know exactly what we're looking for, right? There's, there's abnormalities in the way that bone ridges grow, muscle attachment sites, the formation of certain teeth, right? Like you can, you can see this stuff. There's like a whole field dedicated to not just paleopathology in general, but hominin paleopathology. So I, you can't, you can't make this argument to, to write off all of variation. We just, we, we could clock it. I would argue that a lot of the very, I'm going to make this point, Erica, feel free to respond. And then someone else jump in. I'm going to run to the restroom real quick. And then when I get back, we'll engage your question. So out okay. of fairness to you, Erica, I know you have a question and you'd like us to engage it for a while. And I think it's a good question. So we should dedicate some time to it. And so I would argue a lot of what we see in terms of the variation in these hominins is just natural variation that exists within the, the human genome or gene pool. But then other instances are of inbreeding, they're of isolation, genetic degeneration, developmental anomalies. I mean, I think we would both agree that some of the hominin fossil record is associated with an increased amount of anomalies due to the stressors that they ex existed in, including the environment, including... Well, sure. they, they had super rough and tough Go ahead, lives. go ahead. Yeah, sorry, I totally interrupted you. No, 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 that's okay. <laughs> Erica, feel free to respond. I'm going to run to the restroom real quick. Whoever else wants to jump in while well, I'm I, gone, go ahead. I want you and to then hear we're going to engage response, with Donnie. I want you to hear my response. I'll be yeah, quick. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. So, so in, in a quick way, right? Like what you're saying is akin to, let's say I have a test that, that can specifically clock whenever somebody has a common cold, right? They, they spit on the test and it tells you when you have the common cold. That's like you saying that everybody must who is sick must have the common cold because we can tell when some people have the common cold, right? Like the fact that we can tell when hominins have a paleopathological condition means we also know when they don't. That's your problem here. That's why you can't write, write any of these off, or at least not the ones that are explicitly clocked already as being paleopathologic. Doesn't, doesn't that just assume that they all have the same condition or the condition is affecting them in the same way? What do you mean? Your, the example that you met that you made. Meaning, like, like that can there not be other? Can there not can there not be other things within an environment that would cause a a, a somewhat um, unique change? I mean, there can be like bone remodeling on like the shins. Like, if you have like shin splints, you can get certain remodeling on the on the tibia. But but the point is, we know what causes that. We know what to look for. And not only that, but in a given species, there is an acceptable range that is generally agreed upon that is their species uh, variation, their, their intraspecific variation. Um, and like, you're also not going to get abnormalities that are bilaterally symmetric, right? Like you're not going to get a, a, an abnormality that impacts each zygomatic the same way, both sides of the face, or both humeri the same way or both femora the same way. Like it's just not going to have, that's not the way disease works. That's that's how paleopathology works, right? Uh, I think it depends on whether or not it's like a nervous system. I think there are certain, I, I could be getting this wrong, but I think that's how it, that they tell that you have like a virus or a nervous system uh, uh, issue is whether or not it'll affect you symmetrically or one side of the face or another. Yeah, it's Bell's palsy. Um, Bell's palsy affects the left side of the face. Yeah, so that's what I'm saying. Like, I'm not, I'm not really sure that 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 would really work. If it's you're, it's I don't know. It seems well, kind, no, of a, kind of mysterious. You're kind of, well, you're kind of making my my case here, Sam. Like, Bell's palsy impacts one side of the face, not both sides of the face. That's how you know someone has Bell's palsy. So if you have some kind of paleopathologic condition, it's not going to impact both zygomatics exactly no, the same way. 
Right, but what I'm saying is there are there are conditions that would affect both sides. Bone conditions? I'm not aware of any. Like what? Um, well, I'm just giving you an example that there are certain traits that can affect somebody symmetrically or on one side or another. But now, whether or not I, it, I don't know, you're talking I don't about know a, a bone a bone condition, I I don't know. I mean, I'm I mean, not sure that that we've e examined the right? genome enough to know that a certain mutation at a certain spot can't affect something to change in 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 a certain way. I mean, we well, can tell it, how these guys have cancer, right? Like we've we've clocked Neanderthals with cancer. We can tell how uh, when they have cancer of the bone, how that actually like not only how it impacts the bone in, in a hominin in a human today, but how it actually impacts the bone after preservation because cancer is so prolific, right? Like we know what it looks like is what I'm saying. So I mean, if you want to say maybe there's an unknown thing that's responsible for the variation, like I I can't argue against that. But I, I mean, well, that's see, yeah, I would say, I I would say on your on your on your worldview, Erica, you wouldn't really have grounds to object when you believe that these mutations cause every genetically diverse trait in the world. Right. And so I'm, I'm not sure how you would be able to, to say that anything can or can't happen when you believe that all changes are due to mutations. So, I mean, I mean unless unless there's a unless there's like a specific reason why uh, uh, some unknown mutation can't cause something, which is literally what you believe, then I then I think that you're just kind of appealing to mystery, maybe. I mean, Sam, what you're arguing here is that we can't know anything because anything yeah. can happen, right? I would, like that's... I, would, I, would, I would argue that, yeah. I would argue yeah. that. You so can't I, yeah, I mean, I, I can't... Now. I, yeah, I can't, I can't argue with that. I have, I literally like, yeah. and I, I don't mean this in, in, a, in an offensive way, but I find that conversation to be quite boring. I, I like science. I like things that I can test. So I'm not the person well, you really want to have that conversation with. I, I could jump a, I got a question science. for you, Eric, about science yeah, then. I just said, that's not what I'm arguing now. I'm not arguing that you can't know anything. That, that was something that you, that you said. And I said, yeah, I could happy, I'd be happy to do that, but that's not what I'm saying. I just want to point out a, a, a confusion that I think exists here. It's not necessarily about whether some of these creatures had cancer or a detectable pathology like today, microcephaly or diseases that you can inherit and are pretty obvious because they're in a subpopulation, right? Um, we're talking about a small tribe that like let's just take the hobbit that exists on the island of flores okay whatever species came to the island over time the environment helped shift that group to the way they looked basically i mean that's why you find dwarfed elephants on the island as well because of island dwarfism because of the effects that being stuck and isolated on, on, a, on, a, on an island would result in the small brain size, the small uh, skulls, the small body size, these, these different anomalous features. And Erica, as you probably know, in Contested Bones, in the Erectus chapter, Chris Roop does document a few paleoanthropologists pointing out Erectus morphologies that have been found in aboriginals dating back to, according to the conventional literature, like 30,000 years ago. But they attribute those to inbreeding existing so in a small population because it's it's far too uh, recent to, to be so here's, true. So here's, Go ahead. so here's the problem with that, though. Like, I've heard that argument and I've talked about this every time Root brings it up. It's not one characteristic that defines any species in the hominin fossil record. They are defined by the suites of characteristics that make them unique. So I would not be surprised if you can find a person with a large brow ridge or a person with you know, a ridge on their, on their, you know, around their nuchal region that one would call an occipital bun. I wouldn't be surprised by that. The problem is there's only one place ever where you find all of them, the platycephalic skull, the large nasal aperture, the beveling on the teeth, that's behavioral, right? And it's in Neanderthals. There's only one place where you find the, the diagnostic characteristics of these given hominids. That's why they're diagnostic, right? So no, you, that that's not a, a good argument to make, honestly. I mean, I again, if you want to say that it's 
that it's pathology due to, or not pathology, that it's due to inbreeding, that's fine. But as you said, not every Neanderthal is inbred and all of them have those defining characteristics. So well, because you I have, work. well, because you have Neanderthal tribes existing all throughout Eurasia in separate isolated groups. And so depending on the environment they exist in, depending on how early they are, are they an early Neanderthal or are they a late Neanderthal when they were near extinct? There's obviously right, going to be different degrees of pathology. There's going to... Like I'm, I'm saying that, yes, you find the Neanderthal suites, these characteristics in both the isolated end of the reign of Neanderthals populations 40,000 years ago and in the early Neanderthals, like upwards of 400 to 800,000 years ago. Right. Let like that's, that's my point is that you Let can't assign you. them. You can't assign them to that because they are found universally. Let me well, the Neanderthals, you. I attribute most of their features, like the robust features that we find them in, to the environment that they existed in, to right, cold it's same, adaptation. It's the, same, it's the same with all of them. It's the same with the Erectus. It's the same with Naledi. It's the same with the uh, Leongua Homo floresiensis, right? Like all of them, their defining characteristics are defining because they are present in all of them, no matter where they're found. Right. So it, environment can alter morphology, correct? Yes, that's like, yes, absolutely. Right, you're right. And so I'm saying in, in light of these conditions that we see in the Pliocene, in the Pliocene and all, just the hominin fossil record in general, they existed in conditions that allowed for these types of distinct morphologies to exist. Well, which ones are compared to today. Because that's what you just Pardon? said. You just said you just said some of them, like you you referenced aboriginals, and you said that due to their isolated nature, this is what Chris Roop is saying. That's why they've got the big brow ridge. And then you know you're basically saying that you can attribute some of the morphology of hominins that aren't classified as Homo sapiens to that. Which characteristics? Yeah, but hold on, hold on, hold on. So I I, I think I think what you're trying I think you're presenting a bifurcation fallacy. You're trying to say that because there are certain environmental traits that would cause some changes, that therefore they all have to be um, from that from that same scenario. So like so for an example, would like let's say you have two two cars come off the production line. One goes to a cold environment. The heater might wear out faster. And one goes to a warm environment, the air conditioning might wear out faster, but they're both going to wear out their brakes and their tires. So your genome can, you know, if you if there's a mutation in a certain spot, they could be unrelated, but also shared through different people groups all over the place. Right. I don't see why that wouldn't be the case. Does that not work? Sorry, Sam, you, you cut you out have, for like... You can, have, you can have some traits that are directly related to inbreeding, but you can also have certain traits that are shared based on environments or just the way that the human genome is. Like you can have totally unrelated mutations within a certain similar spot on the genome that would affect both people groups the same way. You can have a okay, similar right. trait that's not right. relevant to the environment or anything. It, but exactly. that doesn't mean that you can't have environmental uh, exactly. mutations. So, so you can tell the difference between the two of this. You're, you're talking about what's basically the I difference don't know how you would. characteristics for drift that are the result of drift and characteristics that are the result of selection. That's that's what you're asking there. And what what while that's important, and I, I want to touch on that, I want to first bring this back around because I, I want to kind of nail Donnie down on this, right? Like, what's the difference between a trait that, how would you, Donnie, or or Roop, how would you tell the difference between a characteristic that is due to degradation, genetic entropy, or something that is morphologic and consistent in the population because it's just how they develop, that is adaptive? Well, how would you tell the difference? Well, I, I think an answer to that question, if I could, just for now, answer a question with a question, your erectus tribes, your erectus groups, what do you think they existed in? The different groups, like how many, how many individuals? Do you think it was 100, 200, 500, 1,000? Which, which erectus? Well, I, I understand different erectus, homo ergaster, homo what, antecessor, would you consider that an erectus? Um, just in general, your erectus group, they obviously all didn't just uh, coexist with each other. They existed in 
similar ways that we see today with hunter gatherer groups, right? They existed in groups. And so how, how large of a population do you think on average those groups were? I mean, if you want to use Dunbar's number and appeal to what's going, sorry, I got a dog. If you want to use Dunbar's number and appeal to what's going to be a feasible number to maintain for the types of foods that they were consuming, as evident by by butchery marks um, in and around where they lived, then you're going to need a, a group size of like 30, 50, 100 people. I mean, it could range greatly depending on this, depending okay. on the group in question. And, and that's and that's my problem is and also my point at the same time is when you have populations like that where you, of hunter gatherer groups as erectus would have existed in between 30 to 50 to 100 well any population that has less than 100 individuals especially over many generations will eventually show evidence of inbreeding and so well, i think we can exist well wait, I, i'm almost done, i'm almost done you'll get as much time as you want and so all we have to do is examine those populations and in those inbred people groups, what kind of, I would call them non-adaptive genetic features. But what we see with Neanderthal, let's say a lot of the, the robust features, I would call those adaptive features, okay? So uh, small brain size, small body size. There's some erectus bones and you know, Chris Roop on uh, in, uh, the erectus chapter, he shows a, a large femur of an erectus and he, he shows how it was uh, associated with, with pathology. And so I would look at those non-adaptive features and I would conclude, okay, those are due to degeneration. Those are the kind of anomalies that are non-adaptive versus adaptive. Go ahead, speak to that a little bit. Okay, so there's there's two main things here, right? The, the thing I'm going to start with, just so I don't forget, is that's my question. How do you tell the difference, right? How do you tell the difference between something that you would describe as genetic entropy related and inbred and something that is adaptive? Now, my second thing is there's a bit of a mischaracterization there, right? Like what you were describing, that's not how hunter-gatherer populations work, and it's not how ancient hominin populations worked either. It's not even how current great ape populations work. They have exogamy for the human in, in the human sense, but male and female dispersal in the primatology sense. So what that means is that one sex disperses from the group uniformly, you, like completely uniformly. In chimpanzees, females leave the group. In gorillas, females leave the group. Once they reach of age, they leave so that inbreeding does not happen. They find another group. And not only, I don't even have to speculate about this with hominids, because we have found specific Neanderthal groups with genetic exchange with Denisovan groups that they were adjacent to, right? right. And with other Neanderthal groups, they were clearly exchanging individuals. Like that's just written in their genes. And it's also corroborated by grade eight behavior and modern day hunter gatherer behavior. So no, inbreeding would not be the final result. And a group size of 100 is actually quite stable. That would have been on the larger end though. So, so I turn it back to you, right? What's the difference? How do you tell the difference between, between a, a morphology that is the result of genetic entropy and a morphology that is adaptive? Right, I think I, I feel like I answered the question because the groups that I would say are some of their atypical features, the result like of reductive evolution, what, like Naledi was found isolated in, in a cave. But what features? Uh, what what features? features? Small brain size, size, curved fingers like we see with Naledi and Hobbit, small you're body saying, size, you're all these kinds of features. That's mechanical. Over, like the but, curvature oh, of the flame is just due to use, not because of inbreeding, in part. But over time, over time, these kinds of features can become fixed where they are the norm for the population. So when you're just when, comparing the population, that feature is oh, that atypical oh. feature has drifted to fixation in the whole population. That's why we see Hobbit as a whole is characterized by the reduced brain size, by the small brain case, by, as you know, I mean, I'm speaking to the choir here. And same with erectus, generally whatever erectus. Yeah, arthritis, arthritis would cause fingers to curve. Arthritis does not cause the curved phalanges that you see in chimps and some australopiths. Like those are, those are clockably different. Um, 
it's completely different how that bone loads based off of arthritis, so, which is pathologic um, and and loading, mechanical loading. It's biomechanics. But no, Donnie, that that doesn't that doesn't though. Like you're, I, I hear you, I hear what you're saying, but you're saying like, oh, the way that you tell the difference is look at the small brains of Naledi, right? Except the small brains of Naledi, that's not due to inbreeding. Every single one has them. They, they, that's they, my that's point. Because be, yeah, because it drifted to fixation, that atypical feature drifted small, to fixation. Small, that's what fixation is. Brains, yeah, but small brains aren't going to drift to fixation. Yes, they will. Absolutely. From, 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 from a homo sapien sized brain. So so you would say then that homo Naledi is in the human No, probably brain. an erectus. I would say Naledi and Hobbit are a more degenerated form of erectus. So Naledi to you is is in the human kind. Absolutely, yeah. Okay. I I I'm glad to hear that. I I'm glad to hear that from you, Donnie. And I'm glad to hear that on uh Floresiensis. Remind um next time you see Bergman, please remind him that Homo Floresiensis does not actually have um a nose ridge for which to send glasses on. Um, and Naledi may or may not, it depends. So, I mean, according to him, that's an ape, but okay. So let's, let's take another step, right? So I'm going to assume, right. I'm going to make an assumption here. Neanderthals, Homo erectus, Homo sapiens, whatever we're going to call Heidelbergensis, which that's actually a, a taxonomic mess to be perfectly honest. Denisovans, um, Naledi and Floresiensis. You're saying all of those guys, humankind. Am I missing anybody? No, you're absolutely right. And keep talking. I'm going to pull up a visual to make it easier for people to see okay. who I would say are human versus your more ape types. Okay. It's an image and, you're, and, you're familiar with, but keep going. Yeah. Got and right so here. my next question is really, it's really simple. Um, why? Okay. So I would consider, firstly, I guess to finish off on the, genetic degeneration topic on explaining a lot of these features. Um, these groups existing this way for a prolonged period of time, as long as they're isolated, you will get different degrees. And that's why we do find, as you know, different um, differences in the morphology of erectus. But generally we can tell if it belongs to the erectus category. I would contest that personally. Okay. But sure. Okay. Well, um, I would argue, especially your populations like Hobbit, which have the most atypical features, Naledi, they are due to severe isolation. Inbreeding, and yes, those features can drift to fixation after many generations. That's what we see in island populations. As a matter of fact, and I think you've seen this, so there's, uh, Chris Roop has a new developments section and we'll get to your, your question about how we can tell what is a human but i did want to show you this because it has to do with homo luzonensis and basically so chris stringer recognizes the role of founder effects in breeding in small isolated human populations he had predicted that additional anomalous looking human bones will be found on remote islands in addition to Floresiensis, right, Erica? And so when That's they a nice found Luz prediction, isn't it? Yeah, but it's consistent with the uh, biblical creation model of explaining these hominins that when you have these groups, the, their dispersal though, because like the reason he's doing this is because of the dispersal of hominins regarding their evolution, how they expand out of Africa. So that I would be interested to hear how YEC would 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 deal with that personally. But I'm sorry, I interrupted you. I got ahead of myself. Continue. No, that's okay. This is good. So basically, these isolated populations, especially your populations that get isolated on an island, and island dwarfing occurs, and the founder effects would result in, as this says, the reoccurrence of these anomalous traits, where they basically become fixed. And that's why we do see similar atypical features in Floresiensis, Lu Luzonensis, and Homo naledi. And so if we go back to this picture, Homo sapiens here, and after migrating to different parts of the globe, you get some 
humans that basically become isolated on an island, for example, with Hobbit and isolated in just certain environments. And over time, those anomalous features become uh, fixed, basically, where that is now the norm. And so we wouldn't say that those are primitive or pre-human. We would say they're essentially the result of founder effects and fixation. Does that help, Erica? Um, it does a little bit, but but honestly, I, I still I don't understand like how you're making the determination here, right? Because some Neanderthals are isolated, some aren't. Naledi's not isolated. Uh, Denisovans isn't isolated. And yet they have these strange characteristics that I'm assuming you would say, at least in the case of Naledi, is degenerative, when clearly what's going on with Naledi is, is actually highly adaptive, given the landscape that it was living in was incredibly forested compared to other hominids. But I, I, I want to put a pin in it. We can, we can put a pin in that for now. Um, why do you think, what, what makes you decide that those hominids specifically are human and the maybe, I don't know, Australopithecus afarensis isn't, or Sediba, or, um, or Africanus? Why not them? They're bipedal. They've got decent size. Their brain size overlaps with Homo habilis. Is Homo habilis human? Is Rudolfensis? What about the Dimenisi Homo erectus? What about Ergaster, right? Because what I would tell you, and, and I tell this to you as as sort of a preface to say that I'm getting into the like I'm I'm knees deep in this myself right now. There is not one single physical characteristic that modern humans have, not one bone, not one knob on one bone that cannot be seen emerging through the hominins over time. From a proto-linea aspera becoming a linea aspera and a bona fide attachment site for powerful gluteal muscles to the minutia of the teeth, the cusps on the molars, there's not one change that is not clocked in the fossil record. And the, the most fascinating part is, is it's in order and it's overlapping. So when I'm talking about transitionals, I'm not talking about species to you here. Right. I'm talking about transitional bones themselves. And I was actually delighted to learn that Australopithecus adiba is not actually the only hominin with articulated remains uh, that are going to throw something of a monkey wrench into the, the designation of some of these hominins, as it were. So, so I want to know why you currently don't think the Australopiths, why aren't they human? Further, why not Artie? Why well, not all the mice apes? I have a question for Erica whenever I get a chance here. That's on okay, you know what, let, let's do this because I have a feeling, given how excellent your question is, Erica, we're going to have a good discussion on this. Oh, you flatter it's, me. Bobby. We're, pro we're probably going to go uninterrupted answering this question for a little while. Therefore, evolution requires faith. W what should we call you? Because I don't want to be saying that every time. That's a mouthful. Uh, oh, you can second, call me. Oh, sorry, Donnie. Go ahead. What, what, what would you like us to call you, brother? Well, you can call me Ed. That's fine. Ed, okay. Yeah. Ed, appreciate you being here. Feel free to, to ask Erica your question. Erica, feel free to answer. And then we will go into answering your question. Because I know Matt will have some thoughts on it too, for sure. Well, Erica, you mentioned, you mentioned the fossil record. And then earlier you mentioned millions of years. So can you prove these things without a shadow of a doubt, without any believing or imagining? Or are these things you just believe happen and you're using them to your theory? Um, no, on the basis of accurate predictions that are made each and every day in the fossil fuel industry, I can assert with confidence, as much confidence as I have in anything in my life, that radiometric dating not only works, but it works in the context of paleontology and paleoanthropology specifically. Yes, I, I have to do no believing with that. That is all experimental. So that thing that you said was survived two million years ago, you can prove without a shadow of a doubt that, that was two million years ago? Without a shadow of a doubt, there's no way you're possibly wrong, no errors, no nothing, you know, for a fact that that's right, correct? And the only reason why I would say it wouldn't is if you want to propose that physics can change. I do not believe physics changes over time. So, yes, I would say that. Well, then no scientist is able to prove millions of years without believing or imagining whatsoever. You can't use the fossil record and the layers of the dirt and all that together. You can't have one predate the other and the other predate the other. It doesn't work that way. You can't take a fossil and tell you can't take a fossil and tell me that a fossil was here two million years ago, but then you can't tell me when it died, when it was born, if it had kids or anything in that process. All you're doing is trying to tell me that it died two million years ago, but you're not giving me any information in between. Why should I believe that two million years? I, because radiometric dating works. 
Prove that. Pro- prove that. Right. Go, go, go fill up your car. All of that gas was found using basin modeling, which makes assumptions on radio, it makes assumptions that radiometric dating works and finds oil consistently. There was a young. No, that's just a talking oil. point, Erica. That's it's, been addressed so many times. It's, they don't care. It, they, they just care how deep the, the, drill goes down dude, to the earth. Dude, Air my, my brother out. my brother-in-law literally worked in the permian basin we've had geologists bed. on many times yeah but, yeah, but that's, that's fine so another you another can, thing you when, you're when you're talking you about when you're talking about the uniformity you okay fine fine you want you want sources you want me to pull up sources is that what I'm, we're gonna I'm do not interested. To guys 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 you, you, a little bit over time let's go one at a time let's go one at a time okay well i'll just say really quick that when you're when you're talking about the uniformity in nature that's only been recorded documented for less than 200 years so you know to extrapolate this uniformity that we observe back millions of years um, it's physics, there's no Sam. you have no rational justification for that this is this is yeah, okay back let back me, to pre erica, let me finish my, erica, 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 erica nobody's you, been you're interrupted just gonna pre-sub at me i, I don't know why you're I'm telling you sam i can talk with all these atheists you make a point and they just get so triggered that's that's because they're afraid of god Erica, um, as long as Erica. You can. Like, okay, well, okay, all night. I really okay, don't. Listen. I've been I'm sorry that to make a point. I'm not. I'm not I'm scared. Patiently waiting to make right. a point. All night long, I will. <laughs> all right, stop, 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 everybody, stop. Enough, this because is a bit too good. much. Okay, okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm just, just gonna jump in. We've been going for four hours, and I'm I'm still getting over a cold, and I'm getting fatigued. So we're gonna move on to Erica's question now. Ed, appreciate you getting your question in there. I think science is less about proving things and more about disproving things, putting forth a hypothesis well, can, or a model and doing just, our best to. I just want to make it. one comment that that the idea that the the that sort of physics has worked in a certain way our entire history, and and we can sort of make these predictions based upon the physics working. And then to suggest that for some reason in the past it was different, no, I, I don't I even know what. I don't know when what to do with that. Like, I know. Uh, you know, I know. That's, that's coming from atheist philosophers of science. Testable predictions, Sam. What like, about all the Christian that's physicists? Called that's called an extrapolation fallacy. It's not, it's and I can, I, can, I can just ask you what makes could, any law of nature real? What makes not those only real? Do I, not only do I have published literature to back this up, but I have personal <laughs> testimony from over five so, geologists so, so, so who somebody, work in the so oil somebody industry. Believes, so somebody has a belief and they publish about it. No, You're not dude, talking it's, about something it's that's literally been demonstrated. Two hundred and forty-seven billion Erica, like, trillion Erica, dollar industry. You become Trill- so rude when you're challenged. Yeah, I don't money, know why. You, Sam, money is king, Erica. Dude. You're you're king. just over talking. I've not interrupted Damn. you. You're so rude dude, when I challenge yes, you. Yes, you have. Okay, I'm talking. Absolutely I'm talking about atheist have. philosophers of science. I don't they, care they, about they explain that, that there is no rational. Erica, oh, why are you so talking? Hard, it's dude. like you're just so emotional. Listen, no, well, that's because I'm a woman. Sam. I'm a, there, women is are no, there is no that. rational justification to suggest that these laws of physics from, from your position aren't even real. What makes them real? They're not imposed. You're talking about it's description. Sad. And it doesn't Sam. follow. Hold on. Yeah, hold on. No, no, he's, it, he's doesn't follow, it doesn't I'm follow that up. because we've observed certain consistencies for the last 200 <laughs> years. That therefore, this, they have been consistent insane. over millions and billions of that years in the past. Thought, that is Sam. insane. Sam, if, if, that is follow, if you follow this chain That's of thought insane. down, then you can't prove that anything past last Thursday is actually true. No, I can't. You can say you can. that nothing exists past that. No, it's precept stuff. I can. I'm, I'm, you, you can. If you no, follow I mean, this I'm, chain yeah, of rationality precept down. Precept stuff is the laziest right. thing I've well, ever heard if, of in if, my if, life. If, if there's really nothing, really hold on. Can. If there's nothing making these laws real, then when you're talking about non-physical laws, I don't even know what you're talking about in your world. Yeah, so... Now, now, on the other case, now, on the other case, if there's a God that's imposing these laws on his creation, no. then I guess we do have <laughs> rational justification, Dude, you but, you, but you don't. So when Dude, you're you talking about when... these laws being consistent, okay, and you're Sam, talking about the Sam, today, Sam you're just, for long you're just, you're, you're just for storytelling. You, you but if, if Erica, enough. if you don't but take you know them what? seriously, then no, how can you continue to interrupt me? You know what I'd like to say? How can you continue to interrupt me if you don't take it seriously? It's like you get triggered and you don't want to let me get my thought out. Why is that? telling to me. 
that the hey, what makes Cindy Law real? I start wait, 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 wait. Is it, Sam, to just, just allow Erica to, to respond and then we'll go back to you. Erica, Thank go ahead. Thank you, Donnie. It is impeccably telling that the second we start talking about one of the main reasons that young earth creationism is empirically indefensible that you back off on the precept. You didn't do that the whole time with the hominids. Well, you just pulled it back fallacy. into a corner. It's, it's an induction fallacy. Fallacy. Sam, Sam, you'll get a chance. Sam, I promise fallacy. you'll get a chance. The, but the second fine. Erica stops talking, it's your turn to go. I would talk. like an uninterrupted opportunity to address them because they're both not letting me talk. It's rude. Listen, Donnie, I, I <laughs> sent you, when I sent you an email and I told you that I was coming tonight and that I didn't want to do precept because I think it's frankly a waste of time because... Sam makes one more presupposition than I do. He's he, I presuppose natural laws are consistent. He presupposes that God made them consistent. I don't care about anything else other than that because there is nothing more to argue. He believes that his book tells him he's right. I believe that it doesn't. Cool. He thinks that God tells him he's right. I think God doesn't. Fine. But outside of that, there's no further direction to take this conversation. So that's why I want to talk about the empirical stuff. If Sam wants to say something else, I don't care. But then, Donnie, I want to get back to the conversation at hand, and I want to know why an Australopith isn't isn't in the human kind. Cool. Sam, no, go ahead, and then we'll okay, move back so, to the human question. The, the whole point is that you are the one making presuppositions that you can't defend. And when you say that the whole precept stuff, all I'm doing is I'm calling you out on that. If you want to invoke that there are these non-physical laws as though they are real and imposed, I want an account for that. If you can't, then you're committing an induction fallacy. There's, these are atheist philosopher of science arguments. Okay, This is called an induction fallacy. And then you're extrapolating them over billions of years. That's called an extrapolation fallacy. So I'm calling you out on your presupposition. I'm asking you to give an account for these things that you continue to invoke. And I get why you don't like that. It hurts your feelings. You have to over talk on me. You don't want to deal with it because you can't. Your world, you can't explain reality. It's very specifically like, like, what is her presupposition? Naturalism yeah, is a joke. Stuff? You guys can't explain morality. You can't explain the uniformity in nature. You guys can't Which explain fallacy. Anything. But you want to be dogmatic about evolution. But even that is challenged by atheist philosophers. Your own camp, as I've been citing earlier to Leo, oh no God, response as, other than he doesn't understand. That's fine. This is, okay. this is an absolute waste of my time. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm yeah, genuinely I'm uninterested in what you have to say here, Sam. No, because okay, you guys, I, I appreciate that. that. I thing. appreciate that side debate. We're going to move back to. The final topic for tonight is I do want to wrap Please. this up by four and a half hours. So, okay. Um, can, can I ask one thing after this topic, Donnie? Just one thing. Sure. A after. Well, and and after. yes. And just for the audience and everyone on the panel, we have another one of these uh, next week in like five or six days. So no worries. Um, Matt, I know you're itching to answer this question too. So we'll... Um, engage this for a bit before we wrap it up. And so basically, Erica, to answer your question as quickly as I can, and obviously, you know, you're going to press me on it. That's fine. Um, first, I would look for evidence of interbreeding, of course. Neanderthals are a given. I mean, we literally have their genetics. We interbred with them. Peers, we formed communities with them. They're a sophisticated people group, right? And I can just demonstrate that from the conventional literature uh, itself. And so I don't think much of that is contested. I got a lot of evidence there for that. Um, secondly, uh, we could look to the same kinds of evidence that we see with Neanderthals, the fact that they buried their dad, they had purposeful navigation, they were a, a an intelligent uh, group of individuals. And so if we find that same evidence in, let's say, Erectus, which we do not to the same extent as Neanderthals, but we do uh, find some of that evidence in Erectus, then that would speak to their humanity due to their intelligence and uh, sophistication. So genetics would be key. So I would predict if we get Erectus genetics, there will be evidence of uh, interbreeding. That I predict, and I wouldn't be shocked to find that. Um, where we don't have the genetics becomes a little more difficult, but again, we can find these kinds of uh, lines of evidence with their practices and abilities. And lastly, certain defining features, which is probably what you're going to want to focus on just in their anatomy, in their morphology, like uh, the feet, hands, the hip. You know, I think there's some 
features that are good to look at in identifying what is human and other features that are not so good. You know, I wouldn't look to curved fingers to identify what's a non-human ape, as you'd call it, because I would hold to Naledi being a human and Naledi had curved fingers. So I don't think that's a good feature to, to look at. Anyways, we'll, we'll start with that. Go ahead. Yeah, so I notice a lot of those are behaviors. And what you have on the screen right now, most of Homo erectus isn't going to check off most of that. Um, there's no support for quite a few of those on the screen there. So behaviors are going to be tough for you to make the case for many of the kinds of, of hominins that you would say are within the human kind. Now, if you want to talk about genetics, we can talk about genetics, but you, you might have an issue there too, because it seems that with, ne with Neanderthals, at least the, the argument that seems to be coming down the pipeline is that there was one way hybrid sterility. So that's not entirely <laughs> interfertile, um, which is, I think, going to be a problem, especially if that holds true for even the older Neanderthals, which would, I would presume under your worldview, be less degenerate as compared to the more recent Neanderthals under conventional lens being 40,000 or 40, yeah, 40,000 years ago. Um, so that leaves us with morphology. And like, I, there is exactly zero room to argue with the current amount of Australopithecus remains that Australopithecus was not a bipedal hominin. Um, that is a, simply an indefensible position at this point. Um, I've seen some of this material in person for myself. I've actually managed to come up with a tally of how many Australopith pelvis we have, how many femora we have, um, the, the feet of some of them as well. Um, and of course, there's the foramen magnum. And I talk about the foramen magnum every time, but that's because we have like over a dozen complete skulls from Australopiths. Um, and it, as in the, with the foramen magnum intact. And when I say complete, I mean counting lateral symmetry across the midline. So there, there isn't going to be an easy swing here. All of what you've listed, except for behaviors, which are, are absent, again, and some of the hominins that you would, you would accept into the human kind, um, all of those char physical characteristics are, again, clockable. You can see everything transition. You can see the loss of the canine P3 honing complex. You can see the arrival of bipedality with the ilium shrinking first before the ilium. You can see alterations in the pubic synthesis. You can see the, again, arrival of the linea aspera from a proto-linea aspera. Well, Shrinan Eric, I think you're bringing up <laughs> quite a few points. Let, let's stick with a point, and I appreciate that. Let's stick with the behavioral and then move on to the anatomical reasons that, that you're pointing to, and then the bipedality, right? And the Australopithecines that you pointed to as well. Um, erectus. I do believe there's very powerful evidence for their intelligence. And one, at least, article associated with a, a peer-reviewed paper going into their navigation abilities, basically that they were open sailors, um, and I think the title of the article is something like, you know, erectus, a sailor, question mark. And so that alone, um, the fact that they could build some kind of device to go from island to island and navigate that way, or apparently they had the controlled use of fire, some evidence for, and there's a whole bunch here um, that, you know, you can look over. Uh, they seem to be a pretty sophisticated people group, just like uh, Neanderthals. Um, but when it comes to the anatomical or morphological uh, features, yeah, I, I would argue that hands would be a great way to tell what is human and what is not. You know, Naledi's hands look human. It's pretty clear. It, it, I think it's easy to tell from the hands, what, what's human and what's not. I think we can look to uh, the feet because I would argue for you to say that Australopithecines have human-like feet, you're gonna have to either look to the footprints like Laetoli footprints, which I would say are actual human footprints. You'll say they belong to an Australopithecine or some isolated foot bones that I would argue, yeah, they look human because they belong to humans. So we could start with that. I mean, uh, feet oh, and hands. Yeah, no, no. I, well, first let's talk about Homo erectus. So the, the Homo erectus a sailor is a late member of Homo erectus. So Homo erectus, if you're taking the, in a broad sense definition, it's 2 million years. So you're talking 2 million years ago to 100,000 years ago. So what that means is that you've got, gosh, if you're looking at Demonisi, you've got 
600 to 800 cc's, almost a doubling of brain case size in that time span in what is proposed to be a singular species. So yeah, it wouldn't surprise me that the ones that lived 100,000 years ago were capable of sailing. I, that's not surprising at all. Their brain case sizes were enormous. They were, the late Homo erectus were on par with the lower end of Homo sapiens as an average. So I, I don't think that's surprising. Your problem comes from early Homo erectus. Things that look human in the face, in the teeth, easily in the postcrania. They've got teeny tiny little brain case sizes and they live in areas where isolation is not going to be your explanation. Not only that, but they still retain some incredibly primitive morphologies from australopiths. Um, not just Dimenisi, but your homo ergaster stuff as well is going to cause you problems. Um, now with regard to hands and feet, okay, again, you're, you're gonna have some really hard times with the literature on that. Hands, especially. The modern human grip, we have, let's see, we have an articulated hand that came from Australopithecus sediba from the arm. Um, the arm is ape-like, the, the shoulder, the scapula is ape-like, it's articulated with the hand, which is described as modern human-like. And you might say, oh, well, you know, mixed bone bed. And I've already told you why that doesn't work. And the, the answer is because- With the hand, the and I want you to continue, Erica, but for clarification, that which is diagnostic about a human hand has to do with the long thumb relative to the other digits, correct? It has to do with that and the precision grip and the the right. um, the relative curvature can help. Although again, mechanical loading can actually influence the curvature of the phalanges, so it's not an excellent it's not an excellent metric. So Sediba, Naledi, Erectus, yeah, and Afrikanus, Hobbit, and all have the same and hand. And All Africanus, human. Australopithecus Africanus, STW573, who Roop doesn't mention, has an articulated hand that's in articulation with the arm and attached to a body that, and creationists, this one's going to be a biggie for you guys once I get this video done, is over 93% complete without lateral symmetry. It's, it is an Australopith. Its brain case is one of the smallest Australopith sizes right? It, there is not a chance that you're going to be able to clock this thing as anything other than Australopithecus. There is no chance for jumbling. It is, it is as night and day as it could possibly be. I can't believe it escaped my notice for this long because this stuff was published on in 2019, um, fully described because the whole thing was in concrete brescia, brecchia, uh, however you pronounce that. Um, and that too is a modern hand. In fact, I can read you a quote from a paper describing that hand using the word modern human-like. So, your okay, so hand you're is saying that that, that you're saying it's that that hand Africanus, with, yes, and I can right, provide right, you Africanus, okay. yes, with a smaller brain than any Australopithecus afarensis. This hominin is older than Lucy. Okay, and you're saying that that hand was found articulated with the arm, and then the arm with the body. Yes, yes, the whole thing. It's it's all in one big chunk. The head is off to the side, um, but there's in fact there's an excellent paper just exclusively showing you in situ pictures as they pull this thing out of the ground. Like explicitly, even better than Australopithecus sediba. So that's going to have to be a problem for you. And you want to know what's worse about, about STW 573? I know why Roop didn't include it now, because they got the foot of this thing too. They got the first metatarsal. That's the big toe. And it is, that sucker is in line. So is the I don't big toe found articulated or was that an isolated find? No, it's articulated with the foot, which is in contact with the metatar or with the, uh, with the tarsals. So you're saying it's about 93% complete and it's I'm saying for it the is most part articulated. Complete. Yes. And for the most part articulated, that's exactly what I'm saying. Yes. Okay. I appreciate you answering those questions. Matt did share something on the screen. L let's allow Matt to get in on this a little bit. Matt, go ahead. You, you've been quiet. So to be fair, go ahead. The floor is yours. All right. Well, we jumped on this topic a little bit earlier, but it, it, it shifted. Uh, you were mentioning about um, bone pathologies that could have uh, affected both sides of the body. One of them was scurvy. They remember that when they first found Neanderthal, they blamed scurvy for their bone shape and uh, how everything was formed. Obviously, they found that wasn't true because they had lots of vitamin C, but their pathology was kind of more based on them living in the northern or colder regions. Another way, um, if we look at the fossil record, we find that all hominid fossils are a little bit higher. Um, and then we find the uh, primate ones a little bit lower. So that would be a good distinction of why we would find it, because obviously if things were to get off the ark, the animals would diversify and migrate fast as where humans stayed together and they didn't disperse until after Babel. 
So they would be in a different, higher fossil record because remember, um, Africa itself would have been devastated from the melt off from the ice age. So I tried to do a little bit of a favor for everybody and kind of show like the diversity of what was going on. Because in our model, we say that when Noah got off the ark, right, he had the most genetic diversity of all. And then as time went on, these different people groups started dying off and then they started, you know, migrating around. And now we have humans today, which have still a lot more genetic uh, or a lot more phenotypic diversity than any other primate would. So we don't agree so much in the uh, Australopithecine uh, combination. We say that they're a branch off of, of humans um, that never were in the tree to begin with. The first thing I always point to would be um, a person who did one of the most sophisticated computer analysis ever on these and found that they have nothing to do with the human ancestry at all. So, of course, there's lumpers and splitters, right? We have them on the side. So uh, is it OK that they're going to have some uh, phenotypic similarities uh, like bipedalism? I That's completely fine because bipedalism isn't... Uh, a litmus test for what makes something humans. I mean, if that were the case, then kangaroos that walk on two legs and other things would be more evolving into a human being themselves. So I don't necessarily say that, you know, just one thing. I did want to answer Erica's question. I did find this. Um, this was observed in the dental records of Australian Aborigines who are highly inbred. And as you'll notice, their chin is very similar to Neanderthal. I did a overlap so you guys can see the difference. It is absolutely incredible how their chin is uh, uh, similar. And this is a recent uh, Australian that was alive at the time. And I think the reason we find lots of diversity um, is because if, ooh, sorry, if we're looking at the uh, Africa itself, it contains the most diverse regions on earth. So when we look at these and we overlay them with where there is the most amount of uh land diversity, population, uh, or I'm sorry, temperature and altitude, we get the most diverse skulls too. We can see it when we look right there at these, uh, we find a lot of different diversity, even though it's in the same region. And I think that's why when we go here, we find massive amounts of diversity, even though they're all living together at the same place at the same time, because maybe they, they, this region has lots of diverse, uh, you know, uh, regions like that so some people lived a little farther away they migrated to this area and they lived together but they had all that massive diversity because just like that map shows the diversity is extreme in those areas and we know from uh, genetics that when populations are small selection isn't as strong so i would say that people adapt much quicker when they are in smaller tribes and populations like that and we found from a study that um only after 10 or 20 generations admixture of genetics. Uh -huh. Ooh. Um, I, I'm sorry. I, I realized I was double muted. I wanted to ask something just a while back, but it, we weren't, it wasn't one of these slides. It looked like it was hinting that the tower of Babel had something to do with separation of people and trying to oh, yeah, that explain one. that. Yes. I would say, I guess, just to go back on the nose, not to get too super spicy, uh, because I know that, like I said, when it comes to biology, I should actually be giving it to the experts. However, I will point out that I know of no scientific methodology or way that you could knock over a giant tower and it would just mess up anyone's language. It would change people. It would do anything. I don't see any scientific backing behind that type of concept. And Erica, before you respond to Matt's points, because I'm trying to look up the example you talked about, Africanus, what was the name of it? Let, let me share my screen here, Donnie, because I actually have it pulled up. There's a, um, the reason you're not finding it is because remember when I was talking about Australopithecus Prometheus earlier? That little foot, yeah. Yeah, this is what Clark is claiming belongs to that. So because I know Littlefoot used to be called Africanus, I believe. Yeah, I think it's still Africanus. So here's oh, the specimen. Okay. This is it on the right. This is over 93% complete. Um, what I want you to appreciate wait, here. Wait, 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 Erica. I don't see it. Oh, sorry. Can you can you guys see it? I just see no. our screen. I just see the call. 
Like yeah. the, oh. I think oh, you might have shared the wrong share window. It. Do I have to share it specifically? Okay, hold on. Stop screen. You gotta select the right window. Present. Share screen. Share screen. Oh, okay. I see the problem. Um, can I just do my entire screen? Yeah, that's what I'll do. Okay. All right. So, um, right. It should be shared. Okay. So this is a specimen, right? You guys see that guy? So that's, yeah, that's the specimen foot. itself. Yeah, that's Littlefoot, right? So Littlefoot's excavation, find the excavation here. Here's the hand. You see that? That's the arm. That's the humerus connected to the radius and the ulna into not just a regular hand. It's a clenched fist. This thing died with its fist clenched. Here is a comparison of Littlefoot's distal femur, right? So the lower end of the femur. It's in the middle, or excuse me, it's um, far to the uh, right over here, SCW 573. Lucy is next on the left. And the one right next to that, you guys, that is uh, Homo erectus. That's Tricana boy. So this thing is a, this thing has a valgus knee. It's, it's a biped. Um, you can't, nothing has a valgus knee to this degree and isn't bipedal. And you know what? I actually really appreciate what Ron Matt had to say. I, if, if you know what, like if, if you're going to say that Australopithecus, um, African or Australopithecus in general was bipedal, but not human for whatever reason, I think that's a much easier sell than what they're trying to say about how it's, how it's not bipedal. Um, I think that arguing it's not bipedal is, is simply indefensible. Um, and I can provide these as well. Uh, let me see if I have, I don't know how you feel about Sci-Hub. I'm not going to show that because it's, I don't lock it as a, as a. Um, I think as Littlefoot a is the least studied even in both camps. Now I know well, it, it, Chris it was. has in So it was Donnie until 2019 when El Se or I don't think it was El Sevier. It was um, uh, the, the journal, but Clark published about five or six articles. Boom, 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 boom. All at the same time. I got like an entire issue. It was a real Artipithecus situation. Um, and that is where all of this information comes from 2019. And the reason that it took everybody so long is because this thing was in concrete brescia down in the bottom right. of the cave. It's impossible to pull out. Right. Um, so let me find a, a good comparison here for the pelvis because there's a really nice look at the shape space. So over here, you can see the vertebra, where the vertebra for STW um, 431, that's Australopithecus africanus, um, 14 and 288, that's Lucy. So this is actually looking at a different specimen of Australopithecus africanus. Um, again, this, this pelvis that you see, the, the paper that this one is on, including this ulna and humerus up here, uh, excuse me, ulna, humerus, and radius up here, this is a different specimen. This isn't even Littlefoot, right? Like we, we have so much from these guys and I, all of them too. And let me see if I can, if I can share my screen on my PowerPoint down here, cause I was working on something to show you this. So this is their this right here, this is from Clark and Tobias, 1995. This was when the foot was first published on. It was the first thing that they managed to get out of the concrete. So over here to the far left, you guys think that's bipedal OH8? Because that's Homo habilis. In the middle, that's Australopithecus sediba, or excuse me, Australopithecus um, prometheus, quote unquote, africanus, and then a human. So the toe is still kind of off to the side, but it is more divergent than any living great ape and indeed almost in line with Homo habilis. And I don't think anybody would look at that and say that that's not a biped. Further, you can look at the metatarsal in its in and of itself. You can see the differences that it has as you move up through time. Australopithecus africanus, this individual is older. How big is the little foot? Ape. How big is the little foot? foot? Um, I don't know. Um, quite not quite a bit. Not very big. I mean, look at it. It's not huge. Well, the human right, foot is right. Right here. Well, so I'm thinking when we compare to like the Laetoli footprints, we're looking at somebody, correct me if I'm wrong, that'd be wearing a size 10 or 11. So we're looking at quite a big uh, for foot. The male, mainly for the an inline. Okay. You, yeah, you so, looked at so, sexual dimorphism for that. Right. And like the sexual dimorphism is, is like a given, right? Like here's the, um, let's see if I can find here on my example of a male and a female for uh, Australopithecus afarensis. Well, it, it's I mean, more extreme than in a gibbon, isn't it? I thought Australopithecus it, had extreme sexual it's dimorphism. It's extreme. So this is Australopithecus. To the lower left here, these are two members of Lucy species, Australopithecus afarensis, and the, the lighter colored one is the male. They are very dimorphic, like gorilla level. Um, at least that's what my advisor proposes, and I, I study dimorphism. I tend to think he makes a pretty good case. Um, so my argument on, because we got a lot of points. Uh, well, let me, let me, show, you this, let me show you this. 
let me show you this last thing. And the reason is because I'm going to okay, send you these papers, Donnie. I'm going to send you all yeah, these papers. You can look so. through them yourself. So there's your lateral and proximal views of the first metatarsal. Here's our view of the cuneiform. So it's the same thing, right? We're looking at one of the tarsals and you're looking at the, the, the change through time. This the, the chimpanzee is obviously modern, but you can see the change through time going from Australopithecus to Homo, or to, um, to uh, Homo habilis to Homo sapiens. And what's fascinating about this particular paper is they go through how some of the bones, the po one portion of the bone will resemble a chimpanzee and the other portion of the bone will resemble modern sapiens. Like you can see the projection here on STW 573 resembles sapiens, right? But it still has that long skinny appearance to it of a chimpanzee, right? Not to say that anything evolved from a chimpanzee, this is our stand-in for a Miocene ape. Um, but but that that's that's my point, right? And this is why I'll stop sharing and 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 shut up here for a second. But like, I get why Roop didn't go over this thing because one, he didn't have access to it when contested bones first came out. To his credit, when it first came out in 2017, this stuff wasn't out. But it's out now, and I've not seen any creation. Well, I, I can speak to I can speak to that. So, as you know, I work closely with Chris Roop. We wrote a. Uh technical paper on genetic entropy together. So you said what I was going to say, those articles that you're talking about in 2019, they were not available at the time when contested yes. bones were being written, but he has confirmed with me numerous times that he's unimpressed with um, Littlefoot and there will be a chapter on Littlefoot in, in the next edition once he's finished his PhD in geology. So that is, uh, coming to the forefront, put it that way, as I, well as some work on Lucy. But I, I just want to say this, Eric, because you did say a lot there. Yeah, no, you're right. You're I think right. a lot of this rises and falls on Littlefoot. So now that it's been years and years, but we do have some solid work, some solid articles to dig into with Littlefoot. And I think a lot of this rises and falls on the validity of Littlefoot, because when it comes to Sediba or Afarensis, there has been a lot of work done on those examples by Chris Roop, for example, who I know you you disagree with. But if little foot is legit, like you're saying, where we have the foot where the toes mainly in line, right? Closer to human and the um, hand as well, that's essentially articulated with the arm, that's articulated with the rest of the body. And what we're looking at is, is a true ape or what you would say is a non-human ape, then we may have to rethink some of our answers in terms of what makes a human anatomically. That's aside from the genetics that I was talking about, the behavioral practices, the abilities, but anatomically, since we are so close to your extant apes and obviously your, your extinct apes there. And so I think there's just a lot of work that needs to be done on Littlefoot. And I'm ecstatic to see that in 2019, there has been a lot done in terms mean, of man? we have these articles available but i will confirm with you yeah chris rube does plan to have a chapter on littlefoot in the future so, hopefully so sooner I, than later so i want to i want to say two things hopefully quickly um it doesn't rest on littlefoot and the reason is because littlefoot its morphology corroborates the morphology of all of the other australopistani right like lucy her pelvis, because I know you said it's it's just a human pelvis in the past. First of all, it's tiny. You should see this thing. It's very small. Uh, but moreover, and it's an adult, so that's why well, I would say it's a, a, pig, a pygmy human. So right. It, so so that thing has an iliac flare to it, right? So an iliac flare is a flare at the at the um, proximal portion, superior right. portion, I guess I should say, of the blade. Um, no non australopith has that. Australopithecus sediba has the flare, Australopithecus africanus has the flare, and this specimen, quote unquote, Australopithecus prometheus, also has it. Moreover, they match in their scapulae. They match in their femoral morphology, as I showed you. So like it, Lucy's femur looks like this thing's femur, which looks like what we have for Australopithecus sediba. This is acting as, an, as a great confirmation of the other Australopith morphology, true. But we didn't need it because, as I said last time, Australopithecus sediba already did it. Because, as you said, if you want to take Ella Bin's argument, right. you've the, got the, this is the flare you're, you're talking about, the B, right? Example B. Um, that looks right. That's Lucy's yeah. Yes. Right. Yes. So, so it's a flare at the tip. Only Australopiths have it. 
And the reason is unknown. I've heard people. Well, well because it, if you look at this example here, Native Americans have a bit of a flair. Right, um, but Arachnus, Neanderthal, Hobbit, and Naledi, who we would say are human, all have a flair as well. So this is just not, normal variation in the human that's, group. That's not a flair, Donnie. Like this stuff has quantitative like measurements to go with it. Humans do not, there's not a single human pelvis that falls into the flare range, not one. And all Australopiths have it. Like this, this is what I feel like you're missing here, right? Like I'm going to send you these papers and what I- Wait, are, are you saying Hobbit paper. doesn't have a flare? The iliac flare? Yes. Um, no, I don't believe so. Although I've heard people argue, I don't think so. I don't think it has the iliac flare. Um, check. Um, but what I was going to say, I, I, is that I thought it did have the flair, which is why some would argue that Hobbit is the result of an astralopithecine. I I always heard Matt Kocheri base it on the trapezium. Okay. Um, of you know LB one. No, but but the, the last thing is is I'm going to send you these papers, and the reason is because okay, that flaring is described as marked. But my understanding here is that it's not on the level of an Australopith. So it's more than a human, but not in the Australopith range. Let me see. Flare. I'll just do marked here. Marked degree. Let me see. I'll, find, I'll try no, to find more on this. I, it wouldn't surprise me, but, but the What about Naledi, though? Eric, I'm sorry to interrupt. Naledi no. displays a, a, a pretty wide flaring iliac blade, no? No. Like, look at the difference. You see, You see how perpendicular to what would be the um, the spinal column the hobbit is as compared to Naledi, which comes in at an angle. Naledi doesn't have the flare. So so the well, problem with this flare. is, so you could say, I mean, you if you want to say that the hobbit is not in the human kind, that's fine, but like- No, 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 I, I would say hobbit is human. That's my point, is we find humans in the fossil record with- the iliac flare. One could argue right, that's normal but, human variation. One, but I, one couldn't, though, Donnie, because but I, I, I do want to make I do want to make one point because I believe there is research to be done here. Okay, I am doing a little bit of it. Chris Rube has active research projects on it, but I would also argue that it's overall agnostic because, as you know, Erica, there are those in the young Earth creationist community, like. Todd Wood, like Matthew McLean, like Marcus Ross, who would look to some of these features that are closely in line with human features as being the result of common design, natural variation within extinct uh, ape groups, basically. And they would look to statistical baromenology and they would look to morphological and anatomical discontinuities to say that they are separate from humans, although very similar to humans. Now, I'm not saying I necessarily lean that way, but it is a possible position to lean towards. Does that make sense, Erica? So so I'm fine with that. That's what Peter of Paleologos holds to. That's totally fine. And, and what he and I argue about is what's sort of the proverbial next step here, right? Which is, right. can you see this morphology change over time? And is it possible to distinguish Australopiths from early genus Homo and then early genus Homo from mid genus Homo, et cetera, et cetera. Can you demarcate it? And Peter would argue yes, and I would argue no. And, and one of my big questions that I've posed to Peter is that when I looked at his statistical baromenology, and and you know, they have these clusters, right? That that's how statistical baromenology works. You have the clusters. Is that applied in a standard way to other animals that discriminates in the same way? Right. Like, is is it going to discriminate like, let's say, different canids from one another? Because, again, I find it suspicious in the same way that I find Tompkins work suspicious is that it's it's applied exclusively to hominins, although I don't think they're doing that on purpose. I, I don't well, know. I, I think if, well, I think, like you said, if, if you go the route of some young Earth creationists where they make statistical baromenological analyses paramount, then it is going to come down to how significant or great those discontinuities are. I'd rather look to genetic related discontinuities like the Y chromosome. Erica, I'd love to have a conversation with you on that in the future. But I also wanted to address this real quick, Erica, and then we'll give you some final words, but we're almost at five hours and I'm going to have to start wrapping it up. But I do want to give you final words real quick, but I also want to address sea science here. And so, no, I didn't say that I specifically believe that Hobbit 
should be Australopithecus floresiensis. No, I'm just pointing out that there are some in the paleoanthropological community that would say Hobbit's precursor was not necessarily Erectus, but an Australopithecine. I would look to Hobbit as being a human suffering from island dwarfism. Anyways, Erica, go ahead. Speak to that if you'd like to. Have some final words, and I think we'll start to. Sure, sure. So, so a couple of things, right? So, I I want to send you the paper so you can see the 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 layout of SCW five seventy three. Which portions are directly articulated? Which portions are uh, imperative to the argument here? I want to send you the paper for um for the uh for the limb proportions as well i'll send you a bunch and hopefully you'll look at it and you'll see because they've got some great charts in there it's all linear measurements like something that i feel like people don't appreciate in paleoanthropology is that it's 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 all gross anatomy like that's almost all it is at least where i work right it's calipers and linear measurements and statistical analysis to see where things plot in relation to one another so SDW 573 plots with the other australopiths in the vast majority of cases. That's why it's so important, because it is not exceptional for an australopith in any of its measurements, which means every other australopith interpretation, including Lucy and Australopithecus sediba, is correct, right? They're not plotting with humans. They're plotting with SDW 573. They're plotting with a basal australopith. Um, I, I would actually tend to agree with Donnie on the um, Homo floresiensis thing. I don't think this thing came from an Australopith directly. I think it came from Habilis. That's my opinion. Uh, and the reason for that is, is Matt Tichiri's work. Again, he's got the, the, um, some of the carpals. And the carpals are a dead wrist. Those are the bones of the wrist. They're a dead ringer for Australopith wrist bones. Uh, but we don't have any wrist bones like that are, are clockable, that are matchable from Australopithecus to Homo habilis to the Lingbua LB1 specimen, right? Like that's, carpals are not, like there's like, you know, a million of them in your wrist and they don't tend to preserve very well. Um, so I don't think you can make the claim that it comes from directly from an Australopith, at least not at present. I don't buy it at least. I think a better argument is, is Homo habilis personally. Well, I do appreciate that. Please do send me those articles because Chris Roop's work on it does seem promising i don't think i'm at liberty to advance anything don't, don't get yourself that, in trouble right so <laughs> but i'd love to join him on some of the research being done on littlefoot send me those articles he has Funny, confirmed I, with me that i urge you i'm i'm urging you here right like the biomechanics are critical here Rube needs to pay attention not just to the bones themselves but the the portions of the bone that are muscle attachment sites, the portions of the bone that are that are different relative to other australopiths. All this stuff has to be taken into consideration when you're talking about not just how bipedal it, not whether or not it is bipedal, excuse me, but how efficient of a biped it is. And all of that comes into play. There's not a single paleoanthropologist, not a single person who studies biomechanics, not a single individual in paleoanthropology who thinks maybe Esteban Sarmiento, I guess, for like R.D. Pithecus, but who thinks that these early hominins weren't bipedal right? They just argue about how much time these things are still spending in the trees. And I'll tell you, yeah. I think it's still a substantial amount. Honestly, I, I think that given the, the, the arms of look at, I mean, when you look at Littlefoot, look at the arms on this thing. It plots almost with a chimp in how long its arms are relative to its legs. And yet it's got modern hands and it's got an inline big toe. I mean, it's insane. This is, this thing is a weird animal. It's very basal Australopith indeed, but um, yeah, I'll send a multi. I appreciate that. Like I said earlier, there are options and multiple working hypotheses, which I believe are important. I'm trying to look at this as objectively as possible, recognizing that there are the existence of uh, artificial species, wastebasket taxons. I understand you wouldn't agree with me to, to the degree of which, but if we were to, as, a, as creationists, take little foot and put Littlefoot into the Australopithecine ape category, then it's going to come down to, are there enough discontinuities in the morphology and anatomy to adequately separate, basically? That's You're correct, extinct? yes. Right, okay. And that's where and the that's, debate would go. That's that's where it would go. And the question would, would then become, um, as, as I believe it was Bill Kimball in his article, Australopithecus to Homo, the transition that wasn't, 
um, how can you delineate with, with a sharp line, like that actually is capable of discriminating the late Australopithecus from early genus homo. Um, and I would propose right. that it can be done. Currently, I'm more confident at the genetic discontinuities than the uh, morphological and anatomical discontinuities in, in just bones, like extinct bones, right? So that is, I think, where a lot of the research needs to, to be focused. I think there are some creationists obviously focusing on that in terms of barominology, Erica. But, you know, I'd like us to for sure continue this conversation, send me those articles, and I'd be happy to look at them and we'll kind of go from there. And Erica, hopefully you can join future check open out. mics and maybe, yeah, go ahead. And then I just tell them to check out my Paranthropist video because genetics, as we continue to pull more ADNA up out of some of the hominins, is not going to be helpful to the young earth creationist case. Anyways, I thought that conversation went like really well for me. I'll be honest with you. I really take it as a win that some of the young earth creationists that we've been talking to for quite some time are coming around to the idea of bipedal australopiths. And as I said to Donnie in that conversation, this shifts our, this shifts our disagreement down the line and we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. But yeah, I'm interested to see if Chris Roop, author of Contested Bones, is able to explain away um, Littlefoot STW 573, because in my opinion, he certainly couldn't do it with anything else. Anyways, my gentle and of course very modern apes, I hope you enjoyed that video. I hope you had as much fun listening to it as I had uh, with having it at the time. If you like what I do, you can support me in free ways by liking, commenting, and subscribing. Or if you want to do more, you can join my Patreon. Patrons get early access to videos some of the time when my schedule permits. And I hope to see you guys um, shortly next time.